it was my recent acquisition of X-Men Magic that led me to reading Black Sun. I remembered, very generally, that Magic had gotten her own miniseries at some point, but I did not realize that it spun directly out of Black Sun. I mean, crap, it even mentions Black Sun right there on the cover. Thankfully, I'd already purchased Black Sun at a sale earlier last year, so finding all of Magic at another was great. That is some easy reading, baby. After having finished its parent book, I'm interested to see what life is like for Magic. Limbo is a recurring location in the X-World, and it's always a different place from book to book. With a ruler like Amanda Sefton, who might use black magic but is ultimately heroic, I figure that'll give the realm some stability, and we can hopefully see the status quo that I wanted so badly from Black Sun. Released just a week after X-Men Black Sun, X-Men Magic debuted in December of 2000. It was written by Andy Lanning and Dan Abnett, two authors whose work I've come to love. Liam Sharp, who I mainly know from a recent run on Wonder Woman with author Greg Rucka, is the artist on this one. There's no inker listed, which leaves me intrigued over Sharp's process for this, but Kevin Somers did colors. Magic only ran for four issues. So let's stop wasting time and break this thing down. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown Episode 4, X-Men Magic. Before I even get into this story, I want to talk about the artwork, because it's different. X-Men Magic does two things. One, it sets a tone, and two, it uses digital effects. I won't lie, the digital stuff is jarring as heck. It looks messy and dark, the lighting isn't always the best, and it definitely stands out from Sharp's normal traditional artwork in the books. However, I would argue that the digital stuff enhances the idea that Limbo was another realm entirely. I mean, flipping time doesn't work there like it does on Earth. Why wouldn't things look different, or be perceived in another way at least? Most of the digital stuff is confined to Limbo, so Earth looks and feels comfortable, while Limbo feels unnatural and jarring. This enhances the book's overall tone, which is suitably dark. Gone are the bright colors of superheroes, thank God. This is a realm of shadows and red rust, filled with dark, malformed demons, ruled by a sorceress queen who must sell her soul to keep it safe. This book feels unnerving, dark, imperfect, and that really works for me. Things start off in the realm of Nightmare. In the Marvel Universe, Nightmare is actually a person, the ruler of dreams, He is traditionally a skinny, gray-skinned man in green clothes with wiry hair. I've seen him face off against Doctor Strange, Ghost Rider, Excalibur, Generation X. He might be a fairly one-note villain, but he gets around pretty well. As a Lord of Fear, and that's with capital letters, Nightmare feeds on, well, human nightmares. But something is different tonight here at the start of our story. Something momentous is happening. Nightmare, ruler of night terrors and bad dreams, finds his own slumber broken by a nightmare. Springing from his bed, Nightmare wraps his cloak around himself and pours himself a drink. Whatever he dreamed, he can't quite place it. It was dark and nameless. As his nerves settle, a mysterious cloud swirls from out of nowhere. The sight of it causes Nightmare to panic, screaming as his glass drops to the floor. This is a suitably off-putting opening. I'm actually kind of torn on exactly how this book was built, because Abnett and Lanning start us off with Nightmare to show us exactly the stakes. Something is very wrong in the magical realms if there's something that can not only frighten Nightmare, but then kill him or kidnap him or whatever actually happens there at the end. We're never shown. However, Nightmare's powers and his skills have always been best shown in the supernatural books of the Marvel Universe. I actually don't think that Nightmare has ever crossed paths with the X-Men, to the best of my recollection. So, while my broad interest in the Marvel Universe as a whole helps me here, if I was just an X-Men fan, this wouldn't convey a lot of information to me. 
It's suitably creepy, sure, and the narration does an excellent job getting that across and explaining what's happening, but if you don't know who Nightmare is, this won't help you as a new reader. Bad things aren't just happening in the magical realms, though. Something wrong is happening on Earth, too. A demon appears in a circle of flame inside an alleyway in New York. Before it can run off, a burst of bright blue light catches its attention. Magic teleports into the alley, her soul sword gleaming, and demands that the creature surrenders. The demon snarls its answer and tries to flee. It finds its path blocked by the arcane fire sent by magic. She traces mystical sigils into the very air and, with a gentle kiss, sends them towards the monster. The spell hits the cars just outside the alley, and they explode, hopefully killing the demon. Magic waits, hoping that this is all over with. But instead, she finds her prey walking back, shedding into its true form, sprouting wings, extra heads, and some extra arms just in case. Magic realizes that she now faces an archfiend from the pit. She teleports behind it, but it quickly turns and fires a blast from its eyes. Magic dodges, but the demon pins her, so she smashes her head against its own, her horn stabbing into it. It backs away in pain and surprise, biting through its own tongue. Distracted, this gives Magic a chance to finish it in one blow. As police sirens close in, the corpse burns, and so Magic teleports out. Authors Abnett and Lanning used this scene in exactly the same way that Claremont did the Nagarai back in Black Sun's opening. This shows us both how skilled Magic is as a sorcerer as well as a physical fighter. Her disdain for her opponent is a clear indicator of her feeling towards this role. She doesn't appreciate this thing trying to prey on Earth and, to be quite honest, wants this over with as quickly as possible. She's skilled, she's smart, and she won't be stopped. Liam Sharp has a particularly loose style in this. The demon is monstrous and inhuman, worse so after it transforms. Despite her bright white cloak and armor, magic is swathed in shadows and muck and grime. Her costume does look less like armor and more like metal spandex, which I think is a bit of a shame. The gold accents from Black Sun are gone as well, making her pretty much white and silver. On the one hand, I like this design choice, as it just cleans things up. White and silver are typically signs of good magic, and in heroic storytelling, are shorthand for virtuous or good people. It also kind of adds a ghostly, ethereal effect to magic's appearance, making her seem less real. But gold is also a sign of royalty and wealth, and as caretaker of Limbo, magic is its ruler. Whether that makes her a queen or a lord or whatever her official title is, I don't know, but removing it makes her feel less like a ruler and more like a warrior. The only other color on her is a set of tattoos around her belly button in red, highlighting the very selective design of her armor. I really like how Sharp makes her hood hang between her horns, a carryover element from the Black Sun series, and it constantly obscures her face. This often leaves only one shadowed, pupilless eye exposed, which makes her look distant and cold. It succeeds in making her look like a badass, and helps her fit with the dark tone of the book. Magic then moves on, visiting the Bradbury Americana. That's an old residential hotel that appears to be occupied by magical or mystical beings. We see a centaur who invites Magic in for a snack, but she passes. She stops at the apartment of a man named Nugent, who's decorated his place like a European castle. He has built, at Magic's behest, a computer into which he has been putting arcane knowledge. Magic's goal is to create a digital library of magical information, which could help her in her task of defending Limbo and, subsequently, Earth. It's been going well, but perhaps better than Nugent planned. He had to move the rig into the bathroom so that he could drain its secretions. Yeah. We leave with Magic, and I'm grateful for it. While the digital stuff fits Limbo's... theme... Sharp uses it to render the mystical computer, and I can't make heads or tails of this thing. There's a glowing light, but I can make out little else. It's just so dark. I like using the digital stuff to showcase Limbo, as I explained earlier, and using it to highlight the unnatural aspect of magic is cool, but man, does it clash here. Magic's next stop is the Church of Kurt Wagner, where she's looking to catch up with her friend and former lover. 
This is also where we learn that Nightcrawler's been narrating the book, which is a smart move. While having Amanda narrate would have given us insight into her character, it would also remove our distance from her. Kurt's perspective allows us to follow along while keeping an air of mystery to Amanda. Her decisions aren't privy to us, thus her actions can still surprise us or shock us, catching us off guard. The pair chats, establishing that Amanda has been acting as the border guard between the realms beyond Limbo and Earth. It isn't easy, but Kurt has confidence in her abilities. She suddenly doubles over in pain. An emergency summoning spell calls her back to Limbo, and thanks to her proximity to Kurt, he is pulled along as well. Magic offers to send him back to Earth once they're there, but the transition has left him sick, so he needs a minute. This gives Magic's military aid, a demon called Vichen, a chance to explain why he summoned her. He gestures at a massive wall that runs the border of Limbo, separating it from the Splinter Realms. The Splinter Realms are a collection of, quote, lesser hells, demon dimensions, and chaotic wastes, unquote. On one side is the demonic might of Limbo, and on the other is an army. Nightcrawler has never seen anything like this, but to Magic, it's business as usual. She orders Vichen to send Kurt home and teleports to a breach in the wall. Nightcrawler asks Vichen for some swords and then joins Magic. The things charging the wall don't seem to be driven by anger or a lust for blood, but rather out of fear. Magic stands resolute, ordering her troops like a general. The battle is joined, and Magic, Nightcrawler, and Vichen hold their own. Eventually, they do win, and Magic's forces chant her name. Her scouts report that the invaders are demon forms from Nightmare's realm, who fled after it was destroyed. I'm not sure if that means Nightmare is dead or captured or what. I didn't think that characters like Nightmare could die, but if not, what could possibly drive his citizens on like this? And I do feel a bit bad that the demon forms got slaughtered just for looking for refuge. I know that they, in some way, prey on humanity, but that's just part of their nature. Here, in the context of Limbo and the Splinter Realms, they're just regular people. All they wanted was to find shelter and safety from some unimaginable dangerous threat, and Magic and her forces just kill them? Or or did, did they kill them? I mean, I'm assuming that demons work like normal Earth-based living creatures, but it's not like that's a given. Bamf and magic. Plus, Sharp's dark, sketchy, kind of muddy artwork makes it hard to tell anything in detail. Magic realizes how dangerous a threat has to be to put all of Nightmare's realm to flight. She offers to send Kurt home now, but no, he passes. He won't abandon her now that he's involved. Magic is glad to have his help, but Vichen interrupts. Someone is crossing the battlefield demanding an audience with her. They head out to see who it is, and it's the ruler of the Dark Dimension, the Dread Dormammu. Holy crap! For the unfamiliar, Dormammu is a pretty big magical deal. As mentioned, he's the ruler of his own dimension, and has often had his plans foiled by Doctor Strange. He's probably one of the biggest magical threats to Earth in the Marvel Universe, and apparently in Limbo as well. If he's crossing the battlefield, does this mean that he was the force that the demon forms were fleeing from? Are they afraid of him? Did he attack Nightmare? I don't... I don't really know how that fight would go. I don't know who would win something like that. Huh. Is this some kind of weird territorial power play wherein Dormammu took control of Nightmare's population in order to invade Limbo? I wouldn't see why, as Dormammu has the Mindless Ones at his beck and call. The Mindless Ones are these massive gray-skinned brutes. They have little in the way of faces, save for a single, flat, wide red eye that they can shoot energy blasts from. Think, uh, think of Cyclops from the X-Men, but like six foot five with the physique of the Hulk and gray. They're pretty unstoppable, although easy to outwit or trick. I don't think that Dormama would really need another force to invade with, but hey, he's a complicated guy. I'm sure he's got plans. Issue two opens with Magic being as flabbergasted by this as I am. Why in limbo is Dormammu here? It isn't for a pleasure visit, that's for sure. No, 
he has a story of the utmost importance to share. Oh, that's a lot less threatening than I thought it would be. Dormammu calls forth his witness, Gleeg, a captain in Nightmare's guards whose post was at the gate. As night settled, a strange storm began outside. Gleeg explains that it split the night, literally, and broken shards of the sky rained down upon them. Those night shards were like living blades, and they mowed through Gleeg's ranks. In a matter of minutes, Nightmare's fortress was engulfed in the dark storm and destroyed. Gleeg, or rather, Gleeg's reanimated head, then asks to be allowed to die. Dormammu releases it and proposes an alliance to magic. Whatever this threat is, it's powerful enough to take Nightmare, who is epically powerful in his own right. The only chance that they'll have against this threat is to stand together. I don't have much experience with Dormammu in the comics. I've read about Nightmare a lot more than the Big D, but it's still fairly weird to see him proposing an alliance at all. I know that Dormammu is shockingly powerful, so this is either out of character or he is really concerned about this threat. The reveal of Gleeg being just ahead was well done. I was honestly caught off guard by it, and I loved it. I almost wish Gleeg's head had stuck around, like Mimir from the newest God of War. R.I.P. Gleeg. You won't be forgotten, man. Obviously and wisely distrustful of Dormammu, Magic retreats to consider his offer. She gathers her advisors, including Nightcrawler, Vichin, and a two-headed green guy named Duke Bellis, asking for their thoughts on the matter. Vichin doesn't trust Dormammu, but Bellis reminds them that this offer is unprecedented. He's so amazed that Dormammu asked for help that he believes the threat must be real. Magic shares that thought, and then decides that they need to confirm his story before taking further action. She orders a scout troop assembled, but Vichin balks. Magic will not have her decision questioned, and orders the demons to follow it. They do, leaving their mistress with Kurt, who was silent through the exchange. She then asks for his opinion. Kurt cautions against an alliance, but if she goes through with this, he'll be there with her. She's going to need someone to watch her back through it. Her forces assembled, Magic and Dormammu, armed with his own contingent of mindless ones, ride out. They approach Muspelheim, the Norse realm of fire, which is ruled by Surtur. But there's nothing there. At all. The guards are burnt skeletons, the lands are ashes and dust. Even Surtur's blade has no flame upon it. She's so shocked by all the devastation that Magic doesn't even notice the shift in the air as a cold front moves in signaling a storm. As with Gleeg's story, the dark splinters of night swirl and dance around them. Then they pass through them, killing demon and mindless ones with ease. Our heroes hold their own, somehow fighting broken pieces of night with swords and axes. I can see Magic Soul Sword, it's a mystical blade, having an impact on these things, but Vichin and Nightcrawler should be relatively defenseless. I think. I mean... Who knows how sharp broken night sky pieces are? <sighs> Bamf and magic. Dormammu suggests that they flee. They can't stand against this force for long. Magic agrees, but doesn't have the power to create a stepping disc large enough for their companies. They combine their power, sealing an alliance, and then teleport out. They reappear in Magic's fortress, but the strain has drained her. Worse, she needs information about that storm thing. After a moment of rest, she contacts Nugent. Nugent has continued in his task, having archived like three-fourths of the world's arcane information. Oh, and he's finished running the information that she's given him about her situation. Nugent suggests that Hades will be the next realm targeted. With her course laid before her, Amanda informs Vichin about their upcoming trip to Mephisto's realm, and then goes to rest and recover. Vichin, when she did that, was chilling with Nightcrawler, drinking a few post-battle beers. Nightcrawler is oddly used to the realm for an outsider, and, at Vichin's prompting, explains about his run-ins with Belasco in the past. Vichin speaks of Belasco warmly. Now there was a tyrant, but seems less pleased with his successor, the demon Sim. Vichin then points out how odd it seems for Kurt, with his demonic appearance, to have been dressed like a priest when he first appeared. Vichin isn't the first person to point this out, 
but Kurt is having a hard time rationalizing it while here. This tiny scene between Kurt and Vichen, it's literally just one page, is a bit weird to me. Up to this point, things have made a good deal of sense. Magic is smart to not just trust Dormammu's word, but instead to validate his claims. When he's proven correct, she teams up with him as a sign of trust. Contacting Nugent makes sense as well. Now that they have seen the threat and still don't know what it is, doing some research is a good move. I definitely feel like there's something up with Nugent and his computer, though. That's just too specific of a plot point to just be random background noise. And all of that stuff is fine, but I'm not sure why the Kurt and Vichen scene happens. Is this to establish why Kurt is pretty cool with all of this demonic warfare that's going down in Limbo? Is it to re-establish this little bit of his backstory? Maybe it's to endear us to Vichen. Because I would argue that it doesn't have enough of any of those ideas to really accomplish any of those goals. I mean, I like seeing Vichen relax with Kurt with some beers. It does endear him to me, rounding him out as more than just some demon. But other than this tiny bit of characterization, there's nothing else there for him. Kurt's final bit about being unable to rationalize his priesthood, reads as really weird. Is this meant to indicate that Kurt is finding himself at home here in Limbo? I could see that to some degree. In this place, Kurt's demonic appearance isn't anything special or horrifying. His combat skills and adventurous nature are being put to a good use. Plus, he gets to fight alongside a woman that he loves, helping to protect her realm and keep her safe. I could see a desire to stay, but I've read stories about Kurt adventuring in other realms, fighting with swords and falling in love, and he always returns home. Plus, I can't help but keep in mind the fact that Nightcrawler mainly appears in Claremont's X-Men during this time, so I know that there's no way that Abnett and Lanning would be allowed to keep Kurt in some weird spin-off miniseries. All of those things being the case, this scene mystifies me. The next day, Mephisto, another powerful demon character, often used as a stand-in for Satan when Marvel doesn't want to publish books featuring Satan, is told of intruders at his gates. Magic teleports into his throne room, not wanting to fight him. Angered at the intrusion, Mephisto orders his guards to take her. Further enraged at this affront, Magic cuts them down, shouting at Mephisto. She came here to warn him, and this is how he reacts? Magic orders him to call off his defenders, but he still refuses. He then grows to gigantic size and launches fire at her in retaliation. Magic teleports to head level and presses her soul sword to his neck. He'll stop posturing now, or she will take his head off. Begrudgingly, Mephisto stops and finally listens. That's when he hears it. Outside of his mountain fortress, a storm of dark shards begins to gather. I think that this brief scene was put here to buy time. Mephisto is generally pretty cool with people coming to his realm. He's a collector of souls, after all, and he likes making deals. I kind of think that he would actually be pretty interested in hearing what a visitor has to say and offer so that he can find a way to profit off of it. But we have a threat coming, and we need to do something badass, so we get this instead. It's not a bad scene, but it just doesn't feel necessary. It's a great ominous ending, though, so points for that. Opening issue 3, where we left off, Mephisto still doesn't understand what's going on. Magic finally gives him the full story, adding the Dark Dimension to the list of Fallen Realms. I... I guess that I had unconsciously kind of assumed that Dormammu's realm had fallen as well. I mean, why else would he be here? But actually, this is the first mention of the Dark Dimension at all, much less a mention of its destruction. When Dormammu showed up at Limbo's gates, he only referenced the destruction of Nightmare's realm, not his own. Was this a careful omission on the Dread One's part, or was it a writing error? Unfortunately, I lean towards writing error, I suppose it's possible that Dormammu is some kind of secret hidden boss to this adventure. It doesn't feel like it, he's been pretty backgroundy so far, but it would certainly catch me off guard. I now feel like the fight that was right at the end of issue 2 may have been padded out to allow for Magic's explanation here at the start of issue 3. 
If she had explained things to him last issue, we'd have gotten a sit rep like three times in two issues, which would be repetitive and bothersome and a waste of panels. So moving that explanation here is a smart move, and if it was Abnett and Lanning's plan to begin with it like that, I applaud. Mephisto's forces fall as the shards of darkness tear through his guards and army. Their brute strength and savage demeanor means little to this strange enemy. But Mephisto refuses to believe it as the darkness enters his throne room. He and Magic hold their own as best they can, but they can't do it forever. Magic presses the point and Mephisto finally caves. Unfamiliar with being so helpless, the Lord of Hell doesn't know what to do. Magic has him bind his power to hers, as she did with Dormammu last issue, and they teleport out. Really quickly, I have a minor mix-up to point out, because that's just the kind of thing that I do. In the previous issue, Mephisto was referred to as the Lord of Hades. Given that Hades, the Greco-Roman underworld, and Hell, the Christian underworld, are very similar concepts, their places of punishment and suffering, I wasn't bothered with them calling Mephisto Lord of Hades. I got the point that they were trying to get across. However, Pluto, the Lord of Hades, will appear later on in this series, and he's, you know, he's the Lord of Hades. So they botched that up. It is a minor detail, and it does very little to derail the good time that I was having, but it is there, and I'd be remiss to let it just slide because of the good time I'm having. The storm of night tears through Mephisto's mountain home, leaving nothing in its wake. Even hell cannot stand against it. In limbo, Nightcrawler is becoming nervous. Amanda has been gone for a long while, longer than her subjects would like. A commotion outside catches his attention, and he sees what it's about. Magic has returned, and Mephisto is with her. The Lord of Lies, further cementing Mephisto as a Satan stand-in, he's legit addressed as such, greets Dormammu, who then returns the courtesy, but magic doesn't have time to waste on pleasantries. The enemy is closing in. She calls for convocation. Nightcrawler, having learned the lore from the locals, shares that information with us. A convocation is a gathering of the heads of the Splinter Realms. It has only ever happened twice in 47,000 years. It's kind of a demonic council of Elrond. The call goes out, and by morning, thousands of various demon lords have assembled. Most are strange, exotic creatures that I have never heard of before. But the specifics of who they are isn't important. What is important is that they've come, and that they listen. Magic explains the threat, what little they know, as best she can, and asks the gathered rulers to make for a formal alliance. All of the Splinter Realms, united as one and bound by blood and magic, could stand against this foe, but only if. There is some squabbling, as some of them consider abandoning their fellows in the name of self-interest, but the voices of creatures like Dormammu and Pluto win them over. They agree to a formal pact, and then it's done. I hate the artwork here. And not just because Magic changed into her formal black leather governmental wear that's basically a headpiece, long gloves, and a black strapless bikini top. But rather, because of how there's nothing here visually. We are told through Nightcrawler's narration that millions of rulers have shown up to this, so I get that Sharp can't draw all of them, especially in multiple panels. But the pages are basically this weird reddish tone with small holes that are meant to indicate seating areas for the speakers. Then, when someone speaks, Sharp has a small balloon panel with their face pop up, there's a brief descriptor of who they are, and then whatever it is that they're saying. It does the job, conveying what's needed, but it's just so uninteresting. And we get the same basic background through all of this, so it's not like there's a great visual range in these pages. The narration tries to wow us with how amazing this event really is, but it just falls flat visually. In another attempt to win us over, the authors even have Nightcrawler, who has seen countless wonders as an X-Man, be impressed by the sight. But then he catches sight of Duke Bellis leaving the gathering. He follows and confronts him, but Bellis won't share as to why he's leaving. 
Instead, he uses his massive arms to land several strong blows, staggering Kurt. That's when Bellis reveals its true identity. Its smaller head shifts and grows, pushing the other one aside until a massive, purple-skinned demon towers over Nightcrawler. This is Sim, former stooge of Belasco, attempted usurper of Ilyana Rasputin, and all-around jerkhole. He was even ruler of Limbo for a while after Ilyana died, until Cable fought him in uh, Cable issue 14. After that, Belasco took back his realm until his fall in X-Men Unlimited 19, which we know about from X-Men Black Sun. Magic enters the scene, also concerned as to why Sim has revealed himself. Sim boasts that he hasn't done anything wrong, merely encouraged the decisions that Magic was already making. She believes that she's uniting the realms in order to stand against their enemy, but all she's really done is to present one unified target for destruction. Now his master approaches. Nightcrawler points to the sky, drawing Magic's attention. The sky, quote, rips open, burns, decays, unquote, revealing the enemy. It is super hard to describe what this thing is. It's a blurry digital effect, some kind of skeletal H.R. Geiger kind of thing, gleaming like steel flesh. This is one of those places where the digital stuff works for me, creating an enemy that is inhuman, massive, strange, and only semi-comprehensible. I can understand just enough of it to be creeped the crap out. While I liked Sim's reveal transformation, the shifting heads thing was neat, I feel like he's unnecessary to this. Even he admits that he hasn't really done anything, he's just encouraged Magic to do what she wanted to do anyway. So, who cares? Why are you here, man? If Sim had never been revealed, nothing about this would change. It's kind of nice to know what he's been up to. As a continuity nerd, I actually asked myself if he was still alive during Black Sun. I just didn't want him to pop up there as he would just crowd up an already crowded story. Maybe if Sim revealed some critical piece of information to our heroes that would help them defeat this enemy, I could justify having him around, but his appearance here is pretty useless. At the start of issue 4, Magic appears to imprison Sim, perhaps teleporting him into some kind of holding cell, as she promises to deal with him later. Sim claims that the enemy has promised him rulership of Limbo once it's done with it. Nightcrawler rolls his eye, sure that whatever that thing is, it'll honor its word. With Sim taken care of for now, Amanda and Kurt teleport to the battlements. Amanda plans to sound the Horn of Harrowing, which will signal the start of the final battle. They kiss, potentially for the last time, and she then sounds the horn. According to Kurt's narration, over a billion beings charge into the fight. The enemy kills 200,000 of them with its first strike. But the realms stand as one. Nightcrawler fights off storm shards with his blades. Dormammu and his mindless ones fight to the east, while Mephisto covers the west. Vichin destroys a thousand storm shards himself before they do enough damage to make him fall, wounded, but not dead. Above all the fighting is magic, her sword gleaming through the storm as she stares into the red eyes of her foe. She then calls on her allies to bind their power again. They do, passing it all on to her for one last spell. But she doesn't fire a Kamehameha, DBZ style. Instead, she casts a spell of divination, hoping to discover what this creature really is. When she does, shame brings her to her knees. Kurt is by her side in one teleportation jump, and she sends him to finish the job. The stepping disc returns Kurt to Earth at Nugent's apartment, where he destroys the arcane machine that Magic had requested. She didn't realize that all of those spells and knowledge might mutate the computer. In time, it gained sentience, and then sent back a portion of itself to guard its own creation. Instead, it made itself a target. And with its past wounded, the enemy in limbo hesitates. Magic does not. With the enemy destroyed, the other lords leave, eager to rebuild and consolidate their power once more. Both Dormammu and Mephisto seem kind of respectful of magic, which honestly impresses me. But Amanda can't quite celebrate the victory. 
They saved Limbo, and quite possibly all of creation, but she was the ultimate threat here. She was the one who had the computer belt, even if she couldn't predict what could happen. But Kurt reassures her. Yes, she did make a mistake, but she also had the courage to set it right and took the authority needed to do so. And as far as he's concerned, Limbo couldn't be in better hands. Well, that took a turn, right? I'm glad I called something fishy with Nugent's machine, but there's no way that I could predict a sentient, magical, evil computer from the future. Who could? That's one massive conglomeration of crazy stuff all piled together. And I have to say that it works for me. By making the enemy this strange, esoteric thing, Abnett and Landing spend less time on it and its relationship to magic, and more on how magic handles the problem. The struggle here isn't the villain that she's fighting against, it's how she fights back. Every move that magic makes is sensible and strategic, even when she has to trust powers that would normally consume Earth in a heartbeat themselves. She's driven, she's smart, and never once does she shy away from the threat presented here. I mean, hell, she stormed Mephisto's fortress alone. That woman is kick-ass! There is a manipulative, cold-hearted, cynical part of me that kind of wanted Magic to have created this situation on purpose once I read everything. Remember, she can travel through time with her stepping disc, so perhaps she traveled to the future looking for some advantage to protect her realm and Earth and saw this go down but the wrong way. So she turns it to her advantage this time around, has Nugent build the computer, and then forces an alliance with the Splinter Realms, with Limbo at its head and her wielding authority over those guys. How devilishly sweet would that have been? It would have been totally out of her character, though. I could see her mother, Margali, doing something like that, but not Amanda. So overall, I enjoyed this miniseries. Is it really an X-Men miniseries? I'd say no. The threat has nothing to do with the X-Men, nor does it influence their world or ongoing narratives. While yes, Nightcrawler does appear, and yes, his personal continuity is acknowledged, this miniseries doesn't impact his story at all. I don't remember even an editorial note in X-Men saying to pick up X-Men Magic for more information on Kurt's adventures there, or something of that nature. His relationship with Amanda is left where it started at, with love and appreciation, and he hasn't changed throughout this story. And it's not his story, so he shouldn't have, but it isn't an X-Men story either. That X-Men on the front cover is there to draw in readers like me, who will always pick up an X-Men story, but wouldn't necessarily jump at a book starring a new iteration of a character that hasn't been seen in a decade. Does this work well as a foundational miniseries upon which other stories can be told? I would say yes. While the rules and visuals of Limbo are pretty up in the air, the focus here was on Amanda's character and making that strong enough to withstand more stories. And to that end, I'd say the creative team succeeded. Yes, I would like a better idea of what Limbo looks like. Typically, it's a volcanic hellscape. Shocking, I know. But here... We're told at one point about the wall, but it just looks like a dark smudge on the page. We are told about the marshalling yard, but I just see some photoshopped brick image. We are told about the grandeur of the convocation, but it just looks like an infected artery. Using the digital effects to set a good tone for Limbo was smart, but the final product was uninspired and ultimately lacking. Which the story made up for, and I like Liam Sharp's traditional stuff a lot throughout this book, so I'm willing to forgive the design missteps. This book delivers on being an entertaining, surprising look at magic and what she has to deal with, and I'm cool with that. I am a bit peeved that there was never more. I mean, if Doctor Strange can hold down various ongoing series, why not a beautiful, powerful, skilled sorceress? But that's just how this works sometimes. I'm going to guess that the book didn't sell well enough to justify a sequel, and to be fair, Limbo is a pretty rare plot device in the X-Books. After this adventure, Limbo wouldn't get used again for seven years when it was the setting for New X-Men's Quest for Magic arc in 2007. In that arc, Amanda is deposed by Belasco and cast out of Limbo. After that, it's another seven years until Amanda reappears, 
this time in Claremont's Nightcrawler book in 2014 that was surprisingly good. I would also hazard a guess that the artwork here was not well received at the time. Even with my rather understanding attitude, it is at best a neat idea, and at worst, but ugly and confusing. So, are you guys sick of hearing about Marvel books yet? I could go on, and eventually I will. Most of my collection is Marvel books, I've got over 6,000 of them, believe me, we're going to be back. But I figure that it's time for a scene change. So I'm going to turn to Image and bring you guys something different. I am a huge fan of author Rick Remender's work at Marvel, and that's carried over to his independent series at Image, except for one book. When I first read it, it just never clicked with me, and next time, I'm going to start examining why. With its recent debut on the Sci-Fi Channel, I figured that this is the perfect time to register for school as I break down Deadly Class. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>